Actually, we're going to jump back into uh, Matthew. Uh, again, our, our passage was from uh, chapter 18. Uh, we're going to look at the first half of chapter 18. Uh, but part of the reason to jump back in, uh, I think it's a good way for us to just keep the world from driving our agenda. You know, if we looked at the news every night and did a topical thing on the news, we, we would never do anything else. We would be responding to the brokenness in this world. Um, so I, I love the fact that we're doing a walkthrough. Um, but we're going to try and map it out through Easter and Pentecost and Ascension um, and leave some space in there too so we can address issues. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of excited about the way that's working out. You know, it's almost a year though in Matthew. Um, but what I want to do to start out, because our passage is about becoming as little children, that's what Jesus said in that passage, is actually go back to that final bit in Matthew 17. It's just verses 24 through 27. Uh, it says, he said, from whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then children are exempt, Jesus said to him. I think that that's worth looking at as we jump into what Jesus has to say about little children in the kingdom. Uh, because we're an extension of that. Jesus claims, you know, he's a child of the king. You know, he was talking about the temple and the temple tax. And saying that he would be, should be exempt but, you know, we're children of the king as well. So those, uh, those observations apply to us as well. We're children by adoption because of what he did on the cross. Uh, so it ties into our passage. But we can look at his example. Uh, you know, we accept some burdens from other kingdoms. You know, there's a burden placed on us as part of the kingdom of God, but there are lesser kingdoms out there. So there's, I would say, the kingdom of non-believers. You know, there are burdens we accept uh, because of how they understand us and because we want to be a good witness uh, in this world. So we're called to accept some burdens just the way Jesus accepted some burdens. Uh, another kingdom is the kingdoms of this world, and, and Jesus was really talking about that in a lot of cases. There are uh, earthly authorities. Uh, you know, when we talked about God and government uh, last week, we're to submit to earthly authorities as well. And the, the third one that I was thinking of was um, some burdens that are placed on us, not that we accept, but burdens that are placed on us, something I would call the kingdom of the air. We have an enemy out there, and there are burdens placed upon us. Maybe we don't accept those. We fight against those. Um, but the kingdom of the air is really a reference to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, when we look at what's wrong in the world, uh, it says this, and this is where it tells us to put on the full armor of God. It says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So all of these types of kingdoms put, put burdens on us. And we accept them because our king accepted burdens himself. Um, so that, that gets us into this passage where um, as children of God we hear Jesus say something about children and their place in the kingdom. Uh, it starts out with the disciples asking a question. They're asking who's the greatest in the kingdom. Uh, it says at this time the disciples came to Jesus and said who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So, so they're asking about positional authority. You know which one's going to have the greater position in the kingdom. Even though just before that Jesus had set aside his own positional authority. When it came to the temple tax, he said, I'm a son of the king. You know, should I pay tax? Would, would my father ask tax of me? And then he went and he paid the tax. He set it aside. And so here they're kind of missing the point. You know, they're, they're not taking his example of setting aside their, their own kingship, you know, their own, uh, their own positional authority. Uh, their own position in this world, and they're asking who's going to be the first in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, one of the things I noticed about that actually too, the, uh, the passage where Jesus pays the tax, is he's already paying for his disciples. Before he even gets to the cross, he's already paying for his disciples. You know, he had them cast a line into the sea, they brought up a fish, and, and it was enough to pay for his taxes and their taxes as well. Um, that's kind of a off topic, but something I noticed this week. Uh, but there's other instances in the gospel where the disciples asked this, in the gospels where uh, the disciples asked this. Uh, Mark chapter 9 starting in verse 33, Luke um, chapter 9 starting in verse 46. Uh, but Jesus' response is basically that the first will be last and the last will be first. And it's not stated quite that clearly in Matthew, but the idea is there. It, probably the most charitable thing we could say about these disciples asking this question is maybe they're asking a question about Jesus' own authority. Uh, 
you know, maybe they're asking him to affirm his own authority as the king. Uh, maybe they're asking that question so he'll affirm his authority and the ultimate victory. But I don't think that's really what's happening. I think Jesus' response bears that out. So picking up in, in verse 2 and going through verse, <clears throat> excuse me, through verse 4. He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So he didn't really take it as a question about his position. He took it as a question about theirs. Um, and, and it's a really striking moment when you look at what he did. Uh, it, it's, it goes counter to the culture at the time. Uh, he, he took a little child on his lap. And this is a man speaking in the public square. And he picks up a little child. And for the Hebrews and for their, that nation, children were valued far more than the other cultures around them. But still, uh, they wouldn't be a part or a normal part of adult discourse in the public square. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, children would have been kind of considered mom's issues up to a certain point. Um, fathers would have been a bit more distant. There are caveats to that. You know, kids would have started working oftentimes with their fathers very early on, which, which is a counter to that. You know, they had a really formative experience with their children. Um, you know, they would have been out working in the fields if their parents were, uh, were farmers. They would have been out, uh, you know, at the shop if, if their parents were merchants. Um, so there was a lot of close time with the father as well, uh, but it was a specific type of close time. You know, they'd learn a trade. Uh, th that's where we get the, you know, Jesus is a carpenter, you know, because he's a carpenter's son. We know he grew up with Joseph. Joseph was a carpenter, and that would have been part of the culture at that time. But you spend that time with your child, you would not have necessarily picked them up and made them a part of this big public discussion. Um, it wasn't until the age of 13 that they would become part of the religious life, you know, of the nation. Uh, it's at that point that they would, uh, they would enter and, and be able to be part of synagogue, um, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so he was looking uh, largely at, you know, the child's role positionally, you know, not on par with the adults, not, you know, a part of the discussions that you'd normally think of, but that doesn't mean they were totally devalued. You know, a child was heir. They were an heir to whatever their parents had. Uh, a child was under the direction of their parents, but along with that, a child was under the protection of their parents. Uh, and they were expected to be obedient to their parents. So, uh, you know, having ch children out playing and doing things and then bringing them in was, was kind of a radical moment. Uh, so Jesus then is telling them, you, you need to be like little children. You need to be like these children. And he's talking positionally. But part of the reason for their position in culture is developmentally where they're at too. You know, they're still learning. So they can't be part of, of a certain amount of discourse. I mean, we see that we have a voting age. We have, you know, we understand that, that there's developmental stages. So they were still learning. They were still growing, you know, physically. Um, so intellectually, physically, but also spiritually and morally, they're still growing. You know, there becomes a point in, in your life where you start to look at other people and you start to see things from their perspective and you start to consider them um, with and sometimes over yourself. And that's a developmental stage. So I think developmentally is worth looking at as well. Uh, and somehow uh, this sort of falls within the scope of salvation within the scope of the kingdom. You know, he asks them, Who, whoever takes the lowly position of a child, that parallels that whole, the, the last will be first part that we find in other gospels. Um, and I think Jesus is asking us to carry that with us our entire lives. You know, we need to take the position of a child, but we shouldn't give that up just because we've matured as Christians. As we grow and mature, there's more to learn. There's more growth and more maturity that comes. Sometimes you hit a point where, you know, maybe early on you thought there was a little bit that you needed to grow and mature in. And you hit a point where you, you've grown and matured enough that you're like, oh, there's other bigger questions out there. So Jesus is calling us to take up the position of a child in his kingdom. And he's saying, that's what's going to make you fit. That's what's going to make you first in my kingdom. Uh, I, I think it fits within the whole idea of how salvation comes. You know, I, I've said before, the first ministry of the Holy Spirit is to bring conviction on us, you know, uh, when we're still 
sinners and separated from God before we've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, it's one of the first things he does is point out your guilt and, to, and let you know you actually need a Savior because so often we just sort of walk around without that. Um, and that brings us to a point of feeling like a child before our king. Um, you know, maybe there's times that guilt brought you low when you were younger as a child and, and it brought about growth as far as your character. Maybe you did something wrong, you felt bad about it, and you decided, I'm never going to do that again. I, I have things in my head that I remember from junior high and high school that I, I, I did that, that struck me in the moment, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to do that again. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a kid named Bill Griffith. He was an awkward kid, and uh, I was sitting in the hallway. I don't remember why exactly. We had something going on in class, and he'd gone to the restroom, and he came back, and I just, as a whim, sort of jumped up and threw, a, threw kind of a kick at him. O only I got him in a sensitive target that I didn't intend. <laughs> and and uh, as I recall, he threw the wooden hall pass at me, and that kind of hurt. Uh, and, and I remember thinking, well, I really deserved that. And I'm never going to act that way again, you know. Uh, we have moments like that throughout our lives. It, that remind us that we have a lot yet to learn, a lot of space left to grow. And it, it do, doesn't just happen in junior high and high school and on, it happens on into our adult lives as well. And then later as you mature, there's these new challenges. The illustration I thought of was uh, going to basic training. You know, I went at the age of 37, you know, and as a PV fuzzy, private, with the fuzzy, you don't even have an insignia yet. Uh, I, I came in as a specialist. Uh, you come in technically as an adult, you know, most, a lot of them were coming in at 18 years old, maybe 20 years old. Um, they were functioning and mature on a certain level, but you get beat down and treated like a child for a distinct purpose. And it brings development. You know, I'd see people come in that were kind of rebellious. They wanted to question everything. And over a period of eight, nine weeks, they'd realize, no, sometimes it's your role to do what's asked of you and not ask questions. And even as somebody coming in at the age of 37, uh, there were moments where I had to learn a few things, you know? Uh, not as much as some of those 18-year-olds, and I was kind of frustrated with some of them. <laughs> but that happens throughout our lives. We face challenges, and we need to be like children. Take those challenges, do what God asks of us, and grow from it and become something more. So unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus goes on and says, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, and that's a key, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a millstone hung around their necks and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed and crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. That's pretty heavy. <laughs> uh, but it opens up saying, who welcomes one such child? welcomes me. And that's something to remember. Um, when he says one such child, it's those who believe in me. He says that explicitly. It's the person who's accepted their position before Christ. And if you welcome one, you've welcomed Jesus. And it makes sense when you realize that Jesus' Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. So if I welcome you as a child of God, I've welcomed Jesus. Because you're one who's being prepared. You know, being prepared for an adult role, maybe. Um, yeah, I mentioned there's, there's places where a maturing Christian or a mature Christian even can be challenged, and there's places where they can be vulnerable. But we're each being prepared for a yoke, for a purpose within God's kingdom. But then it says, whoever causes one to stumble. You know, it's, it's whoever leads them from the path. If you imagine a path and, and it's, it's level, and, but you lead somebody off the path, and it's uneven, it's rough, and you fall aside. Whoever causes one to stumble, woe to those who cause them to stumble. You know, the one who places hindrances in the path of somebody who is trying to mature and become more 
for God and in the kingdom of God. The kind of person who deceives, perhaps, somebody who is on the path and trying to become more for God, who's chosen to be a child before God. Woe to that person who causes them to stumble. And, and stumbling comes. He said, it's an extension of really the brokenness of the world, right? Uh, here, let me find it. <laughs> it's woe to the world because these... Uh, because of the things that cause people to stumble, such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. So such things must come because the world is broken. Uh, I've said that before, Genesis chapter 3, and everything thereafter talks about the brokenness of the world. But there's a particular woe for the people who bring hindrances. And there's particular woe for people who bring hindrances from within. That's why, as people of Christ... We need to take very seriously our own discipleship. We need to look to our growth so that we aren't the ones who cause hindrance, particularly to newer Christians, particularly to less mature Christians. We should look after our own discipleship and growth so that we won't cause hindrances to others. You know, you can think of the stagnant Christian who kind of stands in the way of the one who's on fire for God and wants to do something new. We don't want to be those people. We don't want to place hindrances in the paths of others. And now, for... Thankfully, um, and, and just to highlight the seriousness, of course, he gives this, it's better that you enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. Thankfully, that's metaphorical. <laughs> but he's saying, take very seriously your own discipleship. Be a child and accept correction before God. Because if you don't, there are consequences for it. He talks about cutting it off. And this comes back to that metaphor that we have where Jesus talks about being the true vine and we're the branches, but we're also going to be pruned. Because we're branches, because we have been grafted in, and because we still look like the world, we, we look like branches taken from other trees, we have to be pruned and made fit and productive for the kingdom. And so that's part of what he's getting at in this passage. He's highlighting the seriousness of being a disciple and looking to your growth so that you don't cause others to stumble. And it's kind of end state thinking. I, th that's something that uh, this last week I was thinking about our church and uh, what we are, you know, as a church. And sometimes we think about the building and those sorts of things, but church is about the people. And when you think about the Great Commission, he said, go and make disciples. I saying, what's the end state? What kind of disciples do we want to be building? And what that does is it changes your thinking. When you think about what kind of disciples do we want to be building, you can then start to think about how do you get from point A to point B. So you can think about what kind of disciple you want to be building, but you can also think about what kind of disciple do I want to be. And Jesus is telling us, be very serious about that. Think about what you want to grow into. Be a child before me and think about where you need to grow to and then pay attention to the steps in between. So he, he concludes uh, in verses 10 through 14. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of the Father, faces of my Father in heaven. Uh, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hill to go and look for the one who wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about the one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. So it starts out, you know, see that you do not despise these little ones. And I think that's an interesting word. The word despise there has a couple of implications. It's the idea of devaluing the little ones. See that you don't devalue somebody who has placed themselves as a child before the king, before God, and is trying to be something new, something better. So don't devalue them. Don't walk past them either. See that you do not despise these little ones. And there's also the idea of abuse in there as well. So he says, see that you do not despise these little ones. And these little ones, he said, those who's believed in me. But we can look at it several ways too. We can look at it as all believers, you know. Um, all believers need to grow. All of us are children before the king. There's none of us mature the way he was mature. We can be mature according to maybe the people around us. But before the king... None of us are. We're all children. We can certainly look at it as new believers as well. And I think that's one of the key things that he's pointing out there. 
Uh, you know, new believers need more guidance. New believers need more care. New believers need more protection. I've seen that over and over in churches over, well, let's see here, became a Christian in 97, so uh, y'all can do the math on that one. Uh, but where somebody comes in and they got rough edges as a new believer and the, the stodgy, stagnant old believer just doesn't like the way they behave and treats them badly. Um, and I think Jesus is making a point here about that as well. Don't despise one of these little ones. Uh, and it does relate to salvation. Uh, it, it, depending on your uh, version of scripture, uh, it might include a verse 11. This one doesn't include verse 11. Some of the original manuscripts and scrolls contain the phrase from, uh, from Luke chapter 19. It said, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So it says, for I tell you that there are angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And if we're to take that and put it in to this dialogue, he, he is really talking about the importance of this for a person's salvation and for their continued growth. And he says, there are angels in heaven. Um, always see the, the face of my Father. There's a point here that God always has eyes on us. Not just in that sense of, uh, of God knows and, and God is omniscient, omnipotent, but he does have servants in this world. We talked a little bit about angels as messengers uh, when, it, when we were in the uh, Advent season. But there's angels as those heavenly beings. And this is saying that they have eyes on us and they're watching and they're looking out for the child of God. And then it gives us this illustration of the lost sheep. You know, and it is. It's tied to God's mission. He's talking about those who are at risk, you know. Um, not necessarily those who choose stagnation or, or choose, you know, comfort Christianity and fall away. But he's talking about those who are at risk and he's saying, go after them. Go. Go. Make disciples. He's telling us to go and make disciples from the ground up, starting with ourselves, starting with us being little children. Have the heart of a child so that you can look out for another as a child of God. I think a summary, if you, if you were to say that there's anything such as a mature believer, it's be children before God so that you can protect and guide the children of God. If you have any aspirations to be a leader in God's kingdom, you have to be a child first. And then that will allow you to protect the children of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this challenge that you've placed before us. It's sometimes difficult to wrap our heads around to understand that we should be as children that we should not act in your kingdom as the kingdom of this world acts that Lord we should place demands on ourselves first before we place demands on others that we should receive mercy and grace first so that we'd know how to show mercy and grace we should sit at your feet first so that when we invite people who are lost to sit at your feet. We know what we're talking about. We know who we're introducing them to. Lord God, I pray that each person here takes very seriously the fact that we are children of God. That you have a great deal to teach us. That you are forming us heart, mind, spirit. That Lord, at some point you set us on your lap. And there were others who protected us. And your angels had their eyes upon us. I thank you, Lord, for that. I thank you that you called us first while we were yet sinners. And I thank you that it doesn't end there, that you've invited us to be a part of your kingdom and to grow and to mature. So we'll claim victories for you. That we'll have crowns to cast before you when the time comes. We thank you, Lord. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.